voices shall continually be in my mouth No matter what I see or how I feel As long as I'm breathing, oh yes I'm breathing I'll bless the Lord As long as I'm breathing, oh yes I'm breathing I'll bless the Lord Father have your way in this place You be glorified in it all Come on let's raise it together, say I will bless the Lord at all times And His praises and His shall continue leaving No matter what I no see, no matter what I see or how I feel As long as I'm breathing As long as I'm breathing Oh yes I'm breathing I'll bless the Lord As long as I'm breathing As long as I'm breathing Hey, oh yes I'm breathing I'll bless Come on say, oh magnify Oh magnify the Lord that's the reason why we're here tonight. Let's lay down our cries. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to your Bibles right now. And I want you to turn to Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Acts chapter 16, verse 31. If you got to say I got it. Okay, only, only the young people got it. They're quick on their phones. You ever, you ever talk to a young person and then you try to tell them what to do, but they say, no, no, that's not right. Because I looked at YouTube and it doesn't say that. Right? It's not right. I Googled that, but you just said that, and that's not right. And uh, But how many know this is the world of information? And, uh, but I also believe that this is the time of transformation. Amen. That God's going to transform people. So, I want to give you a little backdrop before I read the scripture. Um, in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, you all know the story. If you haven't read the book of Acts, it's a good um, time to start reading it because you're going to read the story in the back, the, start, the, the, the backdrop of what God was doing when Jesus died on the cross and then the witnesses of his resurrection. And after that, the upper room experience and the birthing of the church. And chapter 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit fell upon people and they got baptized with the Holy Spirit. And, the, and God began to move the church forward. 3,000 people got saved. And then after that, many more got saved. They met from house to house. And God started moving in the church. Amen. But I, I was interested in the story after that story. Because I believe the story continues. Everybody say the story continues. Amen. Because when you get saved, it's great. But man, what God does in your life is better. You know what I mean? So you get saved. That's awesome. You get saved. But now what is God going to do to you? He did something in you, but now what is he going to do through you? And in chapter 16, this is the Apostle Paul got thrown in prison. You know anybody that's been thrown in prison? Well, I have. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, he got thrown in prison, and then something happened. Let's look at what happened. And in chapter 31, or, or, or chapter 16, verse 31, that is, it says, they, they, this is when they, he went into the, to this jail, and the jailers were there. And they, they said something to the Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul, the, the gates were, the, 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 the um, what do you call it, the doors opened up and, and he, was, he didn't escape and the jailers were about to die if they didn't, if they didn't do something about it. And then the jailers said this, said, believe in the Lord Jesus, this is the Apostle Paul that told the, the jailers, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. How many here want everybody in their household to get saved? Yes. Come on, this is for you. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who live in his household. And even at the hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everyone in his house was immediately baptized. Ooh, come on, somebody. And he brought them into the house and set a meal before them and the Bible says that he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We love you and praise you. Have your way here today. Help us to believe for this time of miracles, signs, and wonders. We love you, God. We praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody says, Amen. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell him, you look better than last time I saw you. Come on, son. You may be seated. Isn't that true? We get better and better. Amen. We should get better and better. 
I mean, I, I love believing God for the incredible, for the impossible. And there's a statement, you can follow me, Christian. Believing is the ability to see things others cannot see. Believing is also trusting God in the impossible. Believing is knowing that God has the best outcome. I know mean, God has the best outcome for our lives, right? Yes. Believing is also being obedient and trusting Him for the outcome. So sometimes we, we feel like we're responsible for the outcome. No, that's God's job. Our job is just to be obedient. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell him, you just got to obey. Come on. You got to obey. Sometimes that's even hard to do. Just obey when it doesn't make sense, right? Right? You ever you had children, you told them to clean their room, they asked the, the, this famous word, you know what it is, right? What it is? Why? 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 Because I said so. How many said that before? Because I said so. Right? You don't want to give them an answer. Because I said so. I believe God says that to us. Because I said so. Do you believe in God's word? Come on. Because I said so. Just trust God because I said so. You see, God is in the business of making miracles here today. And if you believe in that miracle-making God, I believe God's going to transform you and your entire family. I'm, I'm a testimony of the grace of God that God saved my whole entire household. My household got saved by the grace of God. My wife and I were able to see all our children know the Lord. Come on, somebody. Not only that, we're believing for our grandchildren. Now, we got three grandchildren, and they're all going to know Jesus. That's right. Come on. My, my kids were all drug kids, amen. We drugged them to church, amen. Hallelujah. And the reason why is sometimes parents, and I get it, you know, you don't want to stuff it down their throat. And, and, and nobody wants anything stuffed down their throat. And I don't want to do that to my own kids either. But we train up a child when they're young so that when they get older, they will not forget their training. So we train them to go to church. So just like you train them to go to school. When your kid says, I don't want to go to school, what do you do? Get up and go to school. <laughs> right? There's no choice because you don't want to go to school. If you're training them to go get educated, well, you got to train them to go get God. Yes. I don't want to go to church. I say, no. Well, do you want your PlayStation after service? Hello, right? Because yeah. we're going to go out to eat some good food. I'm going to give you top ramen when I get back. Yeah. See, that's cold, but it's true. <laughs> I, I brought my church up because of that, man, each and every one of them, they appreciate me bringing them to church because they experienced the Holy Spirit. God had His way. The Holy Spirit changed them. Man, even when they get older, they can't forget what God did in their lives. Why? Because our parents, the parents believe in bringing their children to church. How many parents do you have in the house? Come on, wait a minute. I believe for you, for your uh, children, salvation. But I want to teach you a few things because if you don't do this, my wife and I have now we're in a place of a, this other season that we're in. But I'm telling you, we saw the product of our faith because we believe in our household salvation. Amen. We really believe that our children are going to know the Lord. I believe. How many believe that your children's children, children's children, 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 children are going to know the Lord? Right? Yeah. Oh, come on, somebody. Only two of you. How many believe that your children's children, 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 children are going to know the Lord? Are they going to remember you being that person of faith? Yes. That you believe God, that you trust in God. Last week, we talked about that, amen, that contagious faith. Yes. How many of you have that contagious faith? And when you have that, people are going to know that, they're going to see that. And the young people, the people that you have in your family, they're going to see it. They're going to say, I want that faith. Yes. And that's the beautiful thing. So I want to, I want to give you some things. If, you're, if you want to write down some notes, and I'm not going to go too long today because... Um, I believe God's going to do something this afternoon for us. And we're going to go out in the streets. And I believe some of those that want to go out, I believe God's going to move in a powerful way. But I want to leave you four W's. Is that all right? Yes. And I want you to write these things down. This is going to help you. If you're waiting, how many here are waiting for your brother to get saved? Yes. Your sister to get saved? Yes. Your enemy to get saved? Yes. Come on, man, right? Your enemy. You know? Come on. You're waiting for somebody to get saved. I'm going to teach you four things in that time of the waiting. Come on. Number one, everybody say watching. Okay, how many watchers we have in the house? You know what I'm talking about. You'll sit in the park and watch everybody. 
go, oh yeah, they're looking for drugs. So. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh no, that's not a good one right over there. You're, I'm your watcher, so come on, you, you can admit to it. You're a watcher, just watch. You just watch people. Their mannerisms, their, their, the way they walk, the way they talk. And you go, oh, 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 okay, I see that person. Yeah. And we have we're watchers. Well, the Bible teaches about watching. It's so important to watch. Don't be ignorant of what's happening around you because there's things that are happening around you. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit is doing the work and you don't even see it. When He's doing the work, you got to watch for the work. You see, He's working in your children. He's working in your family. God has already provided a way. He's the way maker. He provided a way for you already. Are you watching here today for that hand of God upon your life? See, God is moving already. Sometimes in the dark season of our lives, we don't see God moving. I want you to, to, to do this today. Ask God to give you the grace to open up your eyes to see what he's doing. Yeah. Remember, the, remember the Elijah was there with the servant and they were praying for rain and it kept looking. He kept going, whoa, watch. Look, look out there. It's coming, it's coming. And one day, ever say one day, there was a cloud the size of a hand coming through and he goes, oh, there it is. God is on the move. How many know that that's going to be your prayer? When you see God move in your children's life, when you see God move, you see the Holy Spirit doing something, man, that's the hand of God. Yes. How many here are ready to watch what God's going to do? Yes. Come on. You see, the, the hand of God is upon your family because now you receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart and in your life and your home. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 says this, Pray always with all prayers and supplications in the Spirit. Being watchful, let me say watchful, to this end, and all the perseverance and supplications for all the saints. In other words, persevere, continue to watch, continue to watch, continue to get in there. It says, Lord, I'm going to wait for you to do a great thing. See, the Bible says in Matthew 26, verse 40, when the, Jesus is about to go to the cross and he was there with the disciples and they were falling asleep. And he says, then he came to, to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, what? He found them sleeping. Then what? I'm about to die on the cross. And you're sleeping? And you're sleeping? The devil's about to come and snatch you and you're sleeping? Man, there's things that you can't see what I see. The devil's in your home and you're sleeping? Got quiet. The devil's watching TV in your home and you're sleeping. The devil's doing what he wants to do in your house and you're sleeping. Right? How many of you love to sleep? I already know some people. You can't wait to go to sleep. Just don't sleep in church. And you're sleeping. You see, I can control what's outside of my house, but I, I say I'm going to control what's in my house. I'm not going to allow things to come in my house that the world is trying to put out there. The world is doing their thing, but my God, I'm going to make sure that God is in my home. Somebody say amen. I don't want to be caught sleeping in my home. And Jesus said, what? He said, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray. Lest you enter to temptation, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You see here, he was disciplining them and rebuking them, and he says, you've got to watch and pray. So in other words, when you're praying, you're watching, when you're watching, you're praying, when you're praying, you're watching, when it is, you're watching for God's hand. You see, if you're going to pray, you're going to believe. I say, I'm a, I believe. You see, the Bible says you're being tossed back and forth if you don't believe. So when you say, I believe, you're watching. You're watching for the hand of God. You're watching for God to move. You see, when you watch, you expect. Let me say, I expect. You see, how many here expect something the supernatural will take place? Yes. Amen. How many expect a miracle in your life? Yes. When's the last time you fasted and prayed for that miracle? Amen. Only one person. Amen. Hallelujah. Fasting is never easy. But it, it, it's something that... God's told when you fast. It's just not if you fast. It's when you fast. Come on. A lot of us just do fast food, but do you fast? Come on, somebody. You see, waiting is watching. Everybody say watching. The other thing is waiting is worshiping. Everybody say worship. 
I love this part because I'm a worshiper, Ray. You're a worshiper. Obviously, you got us to the feet of Jesus, bro. You were there, and I was on, the, I was on my knees because I felt the presence of God in this place. I love it, not only to have it in the house of God, but I love to have it at my house. Oh, my goodness. Imagine having this atmosphere in your home. Even the dogs will get saved. Amen. The cats will be all saved. They'll be using the bathroom, flushing the toilet. Amen. Hallelujah. Things will happen. Change will happen. You know, miracles will happen. You know, if you bring this atmosphere home. And remember the story that I shared earlier in, in, in um, chapter 16? The, the, the prelude to that story was this. It says that the, the apostle Paul was thrown in jail. It says, having received much charge because he casted out a demon out of this person. And they threw him in jail because they, they, they put a charge against him. And he says, they put him into the inner prison. And the inner prison was the inner prison where the sewage would flow into. And so it was the worst part of the prison. And they fastened their feet to the stocks. And this is Paul and Silas. And but at midnight, everybody say midnight. midnight. What midnight means in the middle of the night. Amen. Hallelujah. Just in case you don't know. In the middle of the night, Something happened. Do you know that God's the God of the midnight? He's working in the midnight hour. When you're sleeping, he's awoke. Amen. Hallelujah. He's awake. <laughs> he's, he's up and working. And this is what happened. Right at midnight, Paul and Silas was praying and singing. Now, just imagine the story. They were in the dumb. Hello, somebody. They were in the sewage. They were locked on their feet, and they decided to sing a song. When was the last time you sung a song when all hell broke loose in your life? Right? We say other things besides a song, love. But when you sing in the middle of the darkness of your life, you're going to begin to see things change. You see, they sung hymns to God. And the thing about that is that, how many have a song in your heart? You see, your song is going to carry you through the darkest times of your life. Sometimes we think we come to church, we think that the worship team is here for us. You got it all twisted. It's for God. That's why when we say, come to church, stand up, raise your hand. Because sometimes we stand longer at Walmart than we try to attend a church. See, standing up, see, the Bible talks about being a living sacrifice. That means the reason why we tell you to raise your hands is because we don't feel like it, but that's a sacrifice. You know, I'm tired. And I get it, sometimes we're ill and you can't get up. But for those that can, come on, get up. Hello, somebody. You, you get up and wait for your food. Hello, somebody, right? You get up to do things. But how many know we can get up and worship the Lord, right? We can get up to watch a football game. We can get up to watch a baseball game. But how many know we can get up and watch the praises of the Lord? Come on. You see, that's going to determine if God's going to give you a breakthrough because you learn how to worship in the church. You're going to learn how to worship at home. You see, I, I have some songs. And you probably know some of them, amen? How many know I'm so glad? I, I sing that in the shower. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. Come on. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. I'm so glad Jesus set me free. Sing it. Jesus set me free. Once I was lost, but Jesus set me free. Come on. Once I was lost, but Jesus set me free. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus set me free. See, I sing those songs in the middle of midnight hour. I sing the, this is my desire. I don't know if you know this. The song, I sing in the middle of those times where I feel like all hell is breaking loose. And I sing, this is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you, and all I have within me, I give you praise, and all that I adore is in you. You know the second part? Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I wake, Lord, have your way in me. This is when all hell is breaking loose. 
This is where the bills are coming in. This is where your children are acting up. This is where you got to notice that, that you're sick in your body, but you still sing a song. You still deliberately say, God, you know what? It doesn't matter if I'm walking in the midnight hour. I'm going to sing a song. The devil's not going to steal my song. You see, worship is important because you're going to expel the works of darkness in your home. Do you know when my kids were small, they were getting harassed by the enemy. The devil would come in and they would get all oh, crying and screaming because there are things moving around at night and the kakui is moving in the house. And all kinds of stuff was happening. And what we taught our children is that be calm. We prayed for them. We put on worship music. Right. And we put on worship music, they'll go back to sleep. And even today, they still listen to worship music because worship became a part of their DNA. My daughter became a worship leader because we put on worship at home. Feel me? Come on, somebody. Here we go, here we go, here we go. I'm teaching you how to bring your home over to the Lord. Come on, you need to see. When you worship the Lord, the enemy can't stand worship. When you worship the Lord, you see, the enemy wants you to stop worshiping him so that he can do and speak to your heart. Because when you worship the Lord, you ignore the enemy. He's telling you it's not going to work out. I'm so glad. It's not going to work out. Jesus set me free. Man, you're still bound. I'm so glad. Jesus set me it's not going to work. You're going to die early. I'm so glad. Jesus. You see, when you do that, you stop the lies of the enemy. And then you will see God move. And you'll watch and you'll see miracles. Oh, do you feel me here today? Is there anybody have that kind of faith? Do you believe? Do you believe? See, this is the stuff that changes. You see, you can say I believe, but to do I believe is different. You see, you can say you believe, but to do, I believe. I'm making up words. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Trying to make a point here. You see, when you enter into worship, you'll also enter another room called warfare. And this room, it's not something that we all want to go into, but this is a battle room. It's a room that we battle in, and we fight in, and we get in there because it's a room of that it's full of emotions, and it's full of it's that, that thing that says, I don't want to do this, I want to quit. You know, I'm tired. And think, that room is called warfare. You see, warfare. You see, that warfare room is something that's not attractive. Why? Because there's going to be fire, and there's going to be bullets flying, and you might get hit, and, and things might happen, and, and you begin to get, sorry, the things get into your brain, and you begin to think different. But I'm here to let you know, we're more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. And if you're going through some warfare today, you're in good company. I didn't get here through tulips and roses. I came here from the battleground. I came here from being wounded from my, my feet to the top of my head. I was wounded. I've been hit from the back. Come on, somebody. I got stabbed in the back. Man, I've been talking about it. Come on, somebody said something that got me irritated. Amen. Something's happened. And I just wanted to quit. Is there anybody in this room that knows what I'm talking about right now? You just want to quit. When everything around you is going bad, you're in the warfare, baby. You just enter into the warfare room. Now the battle belongs to the Lord. And that's what you have to understand. First or second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We don't move through the arm of the flesh, we move through the Spirit of God. You see, when you begin to fight, we don't fight with our fists, we fight with our palms. Hello, somebody. We learn how to get in there. My child would say this, my son, when he was wayward and lost, he would tell me when he got home from party, and he says, Dad, Mom, stop praying for me because it kept messing up his heart. He couldn't get high like everybody else because he knew his parents were praying for him. How many here are praying parents? Come on, somebody. You're believing God. You see, you're you and your household shall be saved. If the promise of the Lord, then your entire home will get saved. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. Really pulling down. I say pull down. Pull down those things. Come on. 
Come on, I'm gonna need a time. Come on, you don't want those people to get lost anymore. You gotta pull down the stronghold, strongholds and patterns of your mind. The casting down of arguments. You're tired of fighting. See, we gotta get to the place where we stop arguing and start praying. Because we argue a lot. We complain a lot. We say, if you did this and if you do that, maybe you need to change the atmosphere. He says, you know what? I'm gonna pray in my room. Because this is, this is not happening over here. I'm just going to pray. You see, when you become a person that changes the arguments to a prayer room, to a, a conversation with God, instead of a conversation with somebody that's not going to solve the problem, you're looking for counseling, you're looking for help in other places, but there's nothing like going into the throne of God. There's nothing like going into the presence of God and say, God, Lord, I come, Lord, because my children are wayward, my family, Lord, my cousin, my friend, all those that I've been praying about. You see, when you learn to do that, you bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Warfare is not just yelling at the devil. Warfare is not screaming. But warfare, bottom line, is obedience when it doesn't make sense. Amen. When you stand in the gap, when you hold on to the word that God's given you, the promise. You see, that leads me to the fourth point. Is that you got to trust God's word. You see, warfare will lead you to trust Him in the word of God. And the word of God is so important because it's your edge over the enemy. As yeah. a matter of fact, it's your fuel so that you can continue on. The Bible says we get faith by hearing and hearing the word of God. That means if you're going to believe, you need to get the word in you. The, the verses of Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 in the message version, it says, it says words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit you choose. Right, is your, your words fruit or is it poison? You see, how many here are encouragers? Wave your hand, you're an encourager. You're just a natural encourager. You know, the longer you're in a relationship with somebody, you get more candid, you get more like straight and direct. The other day, and I shared with my wife because it's funny, hello, and I have the pulpit and the mic. And uh, my wife's like, oh no, yes I am, I'm gonna go there. Uh -huh. But I, I was in the car, and you know, I just got, I got out of the dentist, I had to pull a tooth in, my, my mouth was raw. She walks into the car, she goes into the car, she goes, oh my God, it smells like death out here. Your breath smells like death. <laughs> you're killing me, amen, you're killing me. You're killing me, I go, oh, oh, give me a go, hurry up, hurry. I felt so insecure, I didn't want to talk to nobody. You're good, man, you're good, you're good, you're good. You're good. And I'm, you know I can talk to them with your bad breath, like, hey, what's going on, how you doing? Hey, what's up, bro? You know, I'm trying to talk to them direct, you know, you get all insecure. See, my wife and I have that relationship, I can tell them things, she can tell me things, you know, we've grown in our love. We don't have to be fluffy all the time. We can be direct, right? But some of us live in that direct kind of talk. You just tell people, bro, you look fat today. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Man, you, look, you, look, you don't look good today. You look tired. When's the last time you went to sleep? You see, we make people feel horrible sometimes. <laughs> and you don't know that your words are so powerful. And that's why when God speaks of his word, he speaks of it in a way that it brings light to people. It brings encouragement. You see, the word of God is meant to it. fill you full of faith so that you can believe again. Everybody say, I believe again. Come on. You see, your words are so powerful. It brings faith or it deletes faith in somebody's life. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. I love this version. This is the message version. It says, says you're blessed when you get inside your world. It says, your world. Everybody say, I got the world in me. Come on, somebody. Yes, you do. You do. You know what your world is? Your mind and your heart. It's a, if we would display what you're thinking up here, we would all run from the church right now. Everybody's quiet. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't do it, Pastor. I won't. Your mind and your heart is your world. But put right. Everybody say, put right. Get your heart and your mind right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of comp uh, compete or fight. 
See, the thing is that God's calling us to complete, not compete with each other. Come on, somebody. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. That's so good. That is good. Amen. You see, here we have a choice. We have something to decide and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to declare and decree in God's house that my household shall know the Lord. I'm going to declare and decree. The word declare means to proclaim. The word decree means a law. I'm here to let you know. I'm setting things in order. I'm putting things in law. Since for now, for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. Just to proclaim it. I will declare and decree that this is going to be my outcome of life. You know, the watching is the move of God. The worshiping is to sing over your problems. The warfare is being in the room and being obedient. And then the word is to prophesy over your problems to say, God, I'm not gonna pro I'm not gonna proclaim my problems. I'm gonna proclaim my promises over the Lord, over my situations. That is you see, when you learn how to do that, you learn the victory belongs to the Lord, but the victory will also be in your home. You see, if I could have Whoever's going to play the keyboard, come on up. Make <laughs> choice. Come on up. It, 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 there's a story. I, I shared this in prayer, but I thought I would share it with you. And it, 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 it's really good. And, and, and I, I want to help somebody that's believing God for a miracle. And this is, I want you to do this. I want, to, I want you to have this conversation later when you ask somebody this question. I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them what's in your circle. What's in your circle? Now, I'm going to explain that just right now. You see, the, in history that was recorded, I read in the book, Circle Maker, that there was, in history in Jerusalem, there was a story outside the Bible, and there was a man that believed God that he could pour down rain in the middle of the drought. This guy was thinking, different than everybody else because everybody didn't believe but he decided to believe and his name was Honey the circle maker he was recorded in history there was a man that made a circle and when he made the circle he got this staff about six feet tall and he drew a circle and he got on his knees and he told everybody around him and God says I'm not going to move until you pour down rain and everybody was astonished because they said, don't you got to get out of that circle? He goes, I'm not going anywhere until it rains. And so he believed. He stood in a circle. He held on. And everybody thought he was crazy. But he held on in the circle and believed. And guess what happened? It rained. It did. And when it rained, History recorded that it rained like a flood. Man, it came in hard, and people were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The rain came so hard, and then he changed his prayer. Guess what? He prayed this prayer, which was so deep. It was recorded that he prayed this prayer that said, Lord, wait a minute, God, don't pray that. Don't, don't rain that hard. But pray down the rain like grace in his favor. The rain changed, and all of a sudden it came down smoothly. And beautiful. People danced in the rain. People sang songs in the rain. People jumped in the rain. The kids were splashing each other in the rain. They were having a great time in the rain. And it was recorded that he was a history maker because he believed God. Because he believed God, the world around them, outside of the circle, changed. If you believe God in your circle, is your family in your circle? Is your future in your circle? What is in your circle here today? That you're willing to stand and say, I'm not going to go anywhere until you bless me, God. I'm not doing anything until you bless me, God. I'm going to hold on to your promises until you bless me, Lord. I'm going to stand in this circle. You know, in the Bible, in Proverbs, it's, it's a real good read. I encourage you to read the whole thing. Chapter 8. It talks about the history of creating the world and how that wisdom was right along there, the sight of the, the God in heaven and creating the world, the heavens and earth. He created everything. And look at this scripture. It's so deep. It says here 
and continue on. In verse 27, it says, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. Listen. And when he drew a circle on the face of the deep, oh, come on, somebody. It was the first thing that God created on the planet. Before he even created the planet, he created a circle. Why? There was nothing there. But how many know God is a God that creates something out of nothing? So, check this out. Christopher Columbus went out to the world to see if the world was right. He should have read Proverbs chapter 27, chapter 18, 27, and it said the world was round. It would have saved him a trip. Amen. It would have saved him a trip. Because the world was round. It's God created a circle to create a miracle. You see, your circle represents your promise. It represents what God is able to do, what you cannot do. You say, I can't do this on my own. Well, your circle has something that is impossible. But God, the God that we serve is the God of the impossible. He can change the situation. But if you believe and put that faith in that circle, say, you know what, God? I'm going to keep coming to church until you do a miracle. And even when you do a miracle, I'm going to keep coming to church until I'm going to bring my whole entire family. I will stay in the circle and I'm going to keep believing for your financial breakthrough. One day I'm going to own a business, I'm going to be a millionaire, and I'm going to honor God with my finances. And I'm going to see great things take place. I'm going to fund missionaries and do great works. Give your people in the house. If you have this kind of faith, you can change the world around you. The circle maker is making a circle around you. You're the miracle in the making. And God is getting ready to do something and pour out His Spirit upon your life. And things are beginning to change. Because why? Because you started coming to church and begin to believe. Listen up. Listen, everything in my life has gone wrong. Man, so many things have changed in my life. And now I'm beginning, I don't know if I can believe this, but I'm here to declare that God is able to do anything exceedingly above what we ask for. He can do all things that you see. You gotta stand in the circle. You gotta believe for your family to get saved. Man, it looks hard. Man, how many ever prayed? Listen, how many ever prayed that things got worse? Don't be honest. Oh, I prayed it just got worse. It doesn't work. You start, you start, oh, you know why? Maybe the devil is launching an attack against your prayer life. He wants you to quit prematurely so you stop praying. So when things get worse, he's trying to discourage you. But it should encourage you. He said, oh, wait a minute, the devil's mad. Maybe I should pray more. Maybe I should get a hold of God. Maybe, maybe I'll turn it up. I said, I'm going to turn it up. I'm going to fast. Come on, I'm talking a little language here, right? Come on. I'm gonna turn. Oh, well, devil! Oh, you're gonna, you do. I'm a. Oh, I'm a fast. Come on, somebody. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read my Bible. I'm gonna trust God. I'm gonna, matter of fact, I'm gonna put promises on my wall when I walk out. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice. <laughs> it's a different kind of living. But I want you to draw a circle today. Maybe you have a notepad or whatever, and I want you to put in that circle something that you can't do on your own. A mirror. Maybe it could be your son, or your daughter. It could be your future, your business. It could be your ministry. It could be something that the, you build, build. the Lord has given you a promise. And I want you to put it in that circle. Maybe you don't have the ability to do that right now. But maybe when you get home, I want you to pray over that circle. And say, Lord, this is my circle of faith. You see, Christine came up to me after prayer yesterday. And she goes, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor. Pastor. I was making fun of you, Christine. Circle. And God is all over this church, huh? Right? Oh my 